Hello again everyone, Mary Rose here at Stitch Bliss Corner. Uh, I haven't got my scarf on today because I am going to do something unusual because the painter that I'm featuring today for all those art loving stitches out there is Salvador Dali. Now I may at times lapse into calling him Dali because from a very young age when I first saw one of his paintings I've always thought of him as Dali rather than Dali which is the correct pronunciation. So forgive me if I do that. Um, also it's chucking it down outside with the rain so I hope that's not interfering with the sound too much. <laughs> anyway. Uh, before I go on to this outrageous, amazing man, <laughs> I'm going to uh, update uh, certain people who are watching Dragons, that I'm doing Dragons of Sumatra, my version anyway. Uh, I thought I'd just show them because there's been some interest in it. Um, and also, if you are just watching for the first time, or you missed the last episode that I put out. Um, I do have some stitches in my head here from a procedure I had. I had uh, some bone in there that had to be taken out. <laughs> so if I look a little bit sparse just there, that's, that's why. Um, I did have swelling in the eyes, but that's gone down now. Um, so uh, just by way of explanation, if you're just wondering. So anyway, I'll just do the Dragons of Sumatra first and then we can go on to the Master uh, Dali. Now here is the Dragons of Sumatra that I'm doing from Ink Circles. And I'm doing it on Black Ada 18 count. And this is where I am up to. So I don't know if I'm channeling Dali or not, <laughs> but anyway, here we go. Um, that's where I'm up to. So each day, sorry, moving my papers around here, is an adventure because I never really know what's coming up next as far as the colours go. So none of this is actually permanent. It may be that as I go along, I'll look back at something and think, well, that just doesn't go. So that's just for people who are interested to see how the dragons are getting along. <laughs> uh, yes. So I shall put that over here now and get on to Salvador. Dali, or Dali. Now, I'll just show you his self-portrait so that you can, I mean, most people have probably heard all about this man, but some people may not be quite sure. So just to get a flavour of what you're in for, this is his self-portrait. That was in 1941. And he called it Soft self-portrait with fried bacon. And if you're thinking, oh, well, you know, he's probably one of those people that he couldn't draw or paint, so he decided to do something like that um, style, you know. I'll just show you a drawing that he did of someone that he revered greatly, and that was Picasso, a fellow countryman, because they were both from Spain and it's a fabulous rendition of him uh, it just says this previously unpublished drawing by the surrealist Dali both pays homage to Picasso and pokes a little well-aimed fun at him the laurel wreath around his head or is it a set of devilish horns seems to be Dali's joke at his celebrated rival's expense. But whether in praise or derision, Dali has captured Picasso's features with exactness. And I'll show you 
Picasso, who looks to me as though he's... Um, I don't, oh, and he's, he's playing a kind of a xylophone, actually. I thought, I thought I just glanced at it and thought he might be barbecuing something. <laughs> no, he's actually playing a musical instrument there. And as you can see, the likeness is there. So that's just a quick introduction. And I shall show you, too, the picture that captured my imagination when I was about 12, I think, at high school. We had pictures, you know, paintings of the masters and different artists. And someone put this on the wall. And it's called The Burning Giraffe, 1937. And as you can imagine, an image like that, at that time in history anyway, was considered to be absolutely outrageous. So I will go on now to give you a, a bit of a synopsis of his life. And then I have this wonderful book on Dali by Norbert Sorry, I just have to put his last name here. Wolf. Norbert Wolf. And I'm going to go through this to show you his works and maybe comment on a few things as we go through. So I'll try to do this fairly quickly because as the title says it's a dip into Dali uh, because you know he had a long life and he, he did many different things in his life uh, he was the consummate showman and he brought art into the modern world um, and his influence is still all around us everywhere I mean I could have come out here with a tea cosy on my head and you know I don't know, a candle burning in the top of it. And you probably would have thought, oh, that's a bit odd, but you wouldn't have thought it was outrageous, simply because Dali has done it all. He, he forged the path of outrageousness. It's through advertising, it's everywhere. So to try and get a, an idea of how outrageous he was is very difficult today because he did all that, which sort of, brought outrageous behaviour uh, into almost the mainstream now. But then it was completely off the wall. Um, people were, well, he polarised people. You know, some people said he was crazy and just somebody that demanded and wanted publicity and nothing else um, and derided his talent. And other people said he was a genius and... Uh, should be respected for that because his outrageous behaviour was just part of his genius. So, you know, it's really up to uh, the individual on looking back over his life and his works to decide where it fits as far as you're concerned. Um, anyway, get back to uh, facts about him. Now I've got some words here, avant-garde, eccentric, non-conformist and a genius. Uh, anyway, he was born in Fagaris in Catalonia in Spain. That's right near the Pyrenees. Um, and he was born on May the 11th, 1904. He died in January the 3rd, 1989 and he was aged 84 and he died in Figaris. Uh, his resting place is the crypt of the Dali Theatre and Museum Figaris. And I shall show you that at the end of the video uh, to show you the building was designed by him. Uh, many of his works are in there. Um, and apparently to some it's a disappointment because when they go in there they expect to see his works on the wall in a traditional uh, art museum, you know, setting. Uh, well, I mean, anyone who is disappointed, who is expecting uh, something that Dali has designed, a building anyway, uh, to and 
for works of art to be traditionally hung really didn't know anything about the man, I would have thought. <laughs> but maybe it's people that don't know anything about him and they're expecting the traditional museum, uh, not really understanding the character. So I shouldn't really uh, be too dismissive because they're maybe coming from a standing start, so it's probably fully understandable. Anyway, to get back. Um, nationality Spanish, education, the San Fernando, Fernando, sorry, School of Fine Arts in Madrid. He was famous for painting, drawing, photography, sculpture, writing, film and jewellery. Um, now, he did end up uh, marrying, he had a spouse, Gala Dali, and she was originally, she was from Russia, and her name was Elena Ivano, sorry, Ivanovna Diakonova. Apologies to anyone from Russia for that pronunciation. He married her in 1934 and stayed with her until she died in 1982. She was 10 years older than him. Um, he was a polarizing character. Uh, now, a big factor in Dali's life, in my view anyway, was his mother dying when he was 16. Now, when Dali was born, his brother had died and his parents, in their grieving and everything, uh, when he was five years old, they took him to his dead brother's grave and told him that he was the reincarnation of his brother. Um, and they gave him the same first name as well. Um, so that would weigh heavily of course on a child and his mother probably because his brother had died um, she was very concerned about Dully's health and she wouldn't let him go out much you know she she tried to protect him as much as possible so he really didn't have much life experience in that way and his father was a very domineering um, and uh, he was quite a domineering sort of character and, and Dali it sort of looks to me as though he respected him but he was a bit frightened of him and then of course his mother was the protector and then she died so I think it sort of would have been very traumatic of course for him as a teenager but he used to go around uh, Figaris a painting and his mother always encouraged him in his painting. Uh, his father wasn't so keen because he probably wanted him to, you know, have a formal education and go on and follow in his footsteps in the business world or something like that. Uh, but um, Dali, from a very early age, was a fabulous painter. And I shall show you some of his pictures very soon. Uh, this is just to give you an outline. Um, now, his first great influences were... Uh, Picasso, Cubism, and Jean Moreau, a fellow Catalonian, who um, introduced him to the Surrealists. See, what happened was, um, when his mother died, around 17 years old, um, Dali went off to art college in Madrid. Now, when he got there, he was probably quite timid and shy, and because he'd been protected all his life and he came in contact with all these out there kind of characters called the surrealists and I'll give you a def definition of surrealism shortly but suffice it to say they were not people who would fit into ordinary society they went out of the way not to fit in um, so when he you know arrived at art college not only did he join them quite <laughs> boldly <laughs> He grew the sideburns down the side of his face and he grew his hair long, which was no one ever did that in those days. Grew his hair long and basically swanked about and became more outrageous than any of them. And he was ended up being expelled from art school because he told them, his teachers, that they weren't qualified to examine him because he was better than they were, basically. So... Um, so from then on, uh, he 
uh, was more or less on his own to begin with. Uh, he did get, um, sorry, I'm trying to think of her name now, I keep forgetting, Gala. She came into his life, and I think when Gala came into his life, she gave him some kind of direction, because she was probably a bit of an amalgam of his mother, you know, the caring and everything, and his father, as far as she was, had a good business head. So she looked after all his business affairs and everything. So she was a wonderful partner for him. Um, and she actually was married to, to another artist um, and left this artist and child to go and live with Dali. Well, of course, Dali's father was absolutely outraged that he should be living in sin with someone in a little cabin on the beach somewhere. <laughs> and it took quite some time before they were reconciled. I mean, he said he was going to cut him off without a cent and all this sort of thing. Um, let's see where we are now. Dali revered Picasso and his moustache was inspired by Diego Velasquez, the Spanish master. And I shall show you a picture now of that. As you can imagine, I've got all these things balanced on my lap. Now here's the last list. And I probably am mispronouncing that. And that's da Dali's version. <laughs> I mean, isn't that the picture of eccentricity? <laughs> anyway, so uh, what else have we got here? In 1929, he made a short film called An Andalusian Dog. That's the Eng English translation of it in France uh, with Louis Bunel. And it was, it didn't really have a plot or anything. It was only a short film and it was linked by all these macabre images. And the story is that uh, Dali and... Um, Bunel, when they, when it was screened, they had rocks in their pockets in case they got attacked by the audience. <laughs> but apparently the audience liked it, so <laughs> that's something. He met Gala in 1929. And yes, yeah, she was married to Paul Eluard, who was an artist. Um, his father disapproved of Dali's relationship with Gala and felt that Dali was being morally corrupted by his surrealist friends. Um, now, after Dali and his wife got married, they bought a fisherman's cabin in Port Legat, um, and he added rooms over the years. Eventually, Dali's father rethought his son's relationship and accepted Gala. Um, now, Gala ended up marrying, they married in 1934, so they lived together from 1929 to 1934 which in those days would have been absolutely, completely unacceptable to most people for a woman to be living with a man. Um, now, it was described as a tense, complex and ambiguous relationship. Now, he was introduced to America by the art dealer Julian Levy in 1934. And his works were an immediate sensation. Everyone in society and the show business world wanted to meet him and be seen with him. Well, see, this is another thing, too. I mean, people said, oh, look, he's just a big attention seeker. You know, I mean, he wants to be seen with all these people. But the point is, most of the time, that was reverse of that. They wanted to meet him because they'd heard of him and how outrageous he was. And they wanted to be photographed with him and to be seen with him. So, you know, it worked two ways. I mean, you only have to look at the showbiz world, don't you? I mean, 
no publicity is bad publicity. Well, it used to be. I don't know about these days. It seems to have turned a bit. But once upon a time, as long as you were in the public eye, it didn't really matter in what context. You were out there. That was the main thing. Um, now, it says here... Uh, there was a Dali ball in his honour and he turned up wearing a glass case with a woman's brassiere inside it on his, che on his chest, <laughs> which caused a sensation, as you can imagine. And uh, he also attended a masquerade party in New York dressed as the Lindbergh baby and his kidnapper. I suppose um, his wife was the either the kidnapper or the baby, I don't know which. But the outrage was so great, as you can imagine, that Dali was forced to apologise. And of course, when he got back to his surrealist friends back in Europe, they all had a go at him and said, what, why did you apologise? You know, that was a surrealist thing you were doing and you shouldn't have apologised for that. Um, in 1936, he took part in the London Surrealist Exhibition Dali's lecture was delivered wearing a deep sea diving suit and a helmet. He had arrived carrying a billiard cue and leading a pair of Russian wolfhounds. He had to have the helmet unscrewed as he gasped for breath. He said, I just wanted to show that I was plunging deeply into the human mind. In 1936, at the age of 32, he made the cover of Time magazine. And there he is. Look at those intense eyes there. He does look a little bit possessed, doesn't he? But, I mean, he obviously is the showman. He would have been playing that up. I mean, look at his eyebrows. He's accentuated that. Uh, and his little moustache that he had then. Um, and I shall show you also... Oh, well, I'll get round to that in a minute. I will get to the pictures shortly. It's just to give you a, a bit of a, a background to this remarkable person. Um, now, the main patron in London of Dali's works was Edward James. Um, he and Dali collaborated in the enduring icons of the Surrealist movement, and that's the Lobster Telephone and Mae West Lip Soaper, and I will show you those. In 1938, Dali met Sigmund Freud, and Dali started to sketch the 82-year-old Freud's portrait. When he heard that Freud had said of him, this boy looks like a fanatic, Dali was apparently delighted upon hearing this comment from his hero. <laughs> In 1939, André Breton, he was the one that founded the Surrealist movement. He called Dali... Avida Dollars, which is an anagram of Salvador Dali's name. And it was basically eager for dollars. And he was expelled from the Surrealist group, who were mostly uh, communists. They wanted to change society through Surrealism. And they saw Dali as um, a traitor to their cause, I guess. Uh, but when Dali was asked about it, uh, what was Surrealism? He said, I am Surrealism. So, I think he'd sort of gone past that group anyway. Um, Dali and Gala spent the years of World War II in the USA. He designed pieces of jewellery during this period. In 1948, he returned to his beloved Cadaqués and spent the next 30 years there. Um, now, other Spanish artists were very annoyed because he, uh, Dali went back to Cadaqués when... There was a dictatorship in Spain at the time. But the point is, Cadaqués was so vitally important to Salvador. He, he basically said that the sky there was him, the rocks were him. The whole place, he felt as though he was completely connected to the landscape there. So for his inspiration and everything, he probably needed to be there. A dictator or no dictator, or else his work probably would have suffered, in his eyes anyway. Um, now, if we just go through...
Now, Sigmund Freud, who I mentioned, he was the psychoanalyst who influenced Dali greatly because from a very early age, Dali had very, very, very vivid dreams. Dreams that he tortured him and made him very tense and gave him all sorts of hang-ups. I mean, his father apparently showed him pictures of the male anatomy that had been ravaged by uh, venereal disease and all that sort of thing, mostly to ward him off, you know, doing anything untoward before he got married properly and all the rest of it. But for him, for D for Dali, it was uh, terrifying for him. Um, so he had all these hang-ups. Uh, so his wife helped him a lot in that. Um, Anyway, so get back to Freud. The reason why Dali was so interested in Freud was that Freud believed that the mind is divided into two parts, the conscious part and the unconscious part. The conscious mind is what we use to make decisions every day. The unconscious mind is where our memories are stored. Most of the time, we are unaware of our unconscious mind, but sometimes the memories stored up there get mixed up in our dreams, and this is what Dali tried to paint um, and I, I think because his dreams were so outrageous and challenging people were just stunned by what he came what he produced uh, now here I'm going to just go to that I've covered that. I've got all these bits and bobs here. Surrealism began as a social movement. Yes, and so on. We've gone through that. See, the other things I can just do as I go through the book. He even had his own newspaper, and he called it the Dali News. Not the Daily News, the Dali News. Um, and at one of his, he used to go to this club, well, it was a hotel he stayed at in New York. I might have the name of it somewhere. Um, and he used to hold court in the bar every Sunday evening. And all the famous names used to go in there to see if they could, uh, you know, make his acquaintance. And Andy Warhol, the pop artist that was that uh, was influenced greatly by Dali went in there with a lithograph of Marilyn Monroe and he presented it to Salvador and Salvador basically threw it on the floor and then urinated on it <laughs> but apparently Andy Warhol was not insulted or upset by this he just thought it was fine you know um and it didn't seem to do his popularity any harm anyway did it so there you go he got his picture with him that was probably what he was after um right so i'll put those over here now i'm going to now give a warning for the pictures that i'm going to be showing so if you have any children or you know that you don't want to see certain images then you know just send them out of the room or whatever um, I know these days I mean with the internet and everything children see all sorts of things they shouldn't be seeing at their age uh, but I don't want to be responsible for any you know image that a child can't get out of their head so I'm just putting that little warning out now because I'm going to be going on to his paintings very shortly Okay, so I think now, let's see, Harlequin's done all these for me, all these pictures. So I will go to the book and then I'll come back to those images that were done for me, just to finish up. So here's, here's the book. Okay, so we'll just go through here. Now... We've, you've seen the self-portrait already. Now here's another picture of him. He did quite a bit of work that influenced the fashion world. 
And there's a picture of him with a model, a mannequin. Now this painting here is one of the most famous of Dully's portraits. Um, and it's not portrait, painting anyway. It's called The Persistence of Memory. And it's nine and a half inches by 13 inches or 24.1 centimetres by 33 centimetres. And it's the, in the New York Museum of Modern Art. So Ingeborg, when you were there, I hope you got to see this. And I shall read you what it says about it. And then I'll show you the picture again. The melting of the clocks and the human form, the transformation into non-Euclidean amorphousness are references to the trickling away of time in the sense of traditional vanitas. The theme of the transience, transience of life in his memoir, The Secret Life of Salvador Dali, the artist recounts the story of his inspiration for this image, which reappeared in numerous variations in many of his later works. He had eaten melting camembert for dinner. Later, plagued by a migraine, he ruminated on the philosophical concept of the super soft that made a change to an oil painting that he had already begun. He added the watches, melting like over overripe cheese. After all, he said, soft watches are nothing more than the paranoid, critical, tender, extravagant version of a camembert that has been abandoned by time and space. So, <laughs> as you can see, his beloved landscape of Catechus is in the background there. And here are his images. There are ants there on that stuff. So that's that famous one. Now, at 22 years old, this is just to show you what he was like before he went to art school. And some parents might lament. Uh, his parent, his father, might have lamented sending him there. Because, well, it's not before he went. I think he was, because obviously, how old is he here? 1926. Well, in 1904 he was born. Oh, well, you, you know, whatever. Um, he was capable of quite realistic images in his painting. And he had a thing for bread. For reasons best known to himself. Now this one here, it's called the Fran Phantom... Cart, 1933. Now, I'll read this to you and then you'll be able to see it. The Phantom Cart, it captures the character of the Catalonian landscape in this region better than most any other of Dali's paintings. At the same time, the piece owes its spectral tenor to the deliberate influence of virtual reality, embodied here in the church tower, which has been transformed into an active character. So you'll see now what I'm getting at here. If you look there, you can see it looks like a phantom car, doesn't it? I'll just turn this light off. I don't think that's helping. Um, that cart there, if you see in the middle of it, there's like a figure with a rounded head. Just there. Actually, that's part of the building in the distance. But Dali has incorporated, incorporated it in so it looks like a person driving the cart. Um, gee, that, it's a pity about that reflection. That's a bit better. I'll try to minimise the reflection. So I'm trying not to lose my markers. <laughs> so... That's that one. Now, this one is a favourite of mine. And 
he was 15 but he painted that so no wonder his mother was so proud of his talent his sister was annoyed uh, because she said he used to get whatever he wanted she said he was indulged now this one here we've jumped here this is 1963 but it's just to give you an idea of how his brother's uh, fate must have dominated a lot of Dully's subconscious and it's a picture of um, Portrait of My Dead Brother, 1963. And he said of his brother, we resembled each other like two drops of water, but we had different reflections. Now, this one here is particularly grotesque, I think you'd say. Portrait of Picasso. Um, and the portrait painted in California reflects Dali's perception of his famous countryman's artwork, that it was not concerned with beauty, but rather with ugliness. So maybe he didn't think much of cubism then. But it's quite ironic because he's created something quite ugly himself, isn't he there? Now, here's a, a rear view of Dully's sister, Anna Maria, looking out over the harbour there, or over the water which is really beautiful, isn't it? Lovely muted tones. So obviously he was someone who could paint whatever he wanted to. That's the point. And he didn't really have to court all this um, controversy, shall we say. Now then. Let's move that. Oh, here are some advertisements inspired by Dully. There's one for a Datsun with the melted watch. And he also did an ad for chocolate as well, which you can see on the internet if you... I'll oh, see. I might remember to link it. I just don't know. Now, this particular one... If you're a bit prudish or anything like that, you might care to go, <laughs> go past it. But it is important because uh, it's one of Dali's most important works. Um, now, the rocks of Catechis did give Dali a lot of um, inspiration. And from this rock here, the next image and if you can see um, well hang on, I'll just show you the image now this is called the great masturbator and there is the image now it is confronting because you know there's a man there and a female and Apparently he was terrified of grasshoppers. So where the mouth should be, this is, that's the nose, of course, where the mouth should be, there's this grasshopper clamped on. And, you know, at the same time, it's sort of decomposing and all that sort of thing. So I think this is where he, Sigmund Freud, encouraged people to bring out all their subconscious thoughts and everything to help to heal their mental problems and it looks like this was Dali's way of coping with all these dreadful images in his head um, 
but it, it, you know it's a very famous piece uh, let's see what it says here well I think I've said mostly uh, if you want to study it in more detail you can <laughs> have a look at it um, now this one here there are two images here uh, and it's a tribute apparently to him and his wife in a way uh, they've got their heads full of clouds him and his wife so there's Dali there and Carla and I think that the thing with Gala that Dali appreciated was that she she tried to understand and accept him the way he was um, he had his dalliances on the side and all the rest of it which most artists seem to do that um, but she was always very confident in his dependence and love for her um, it, as far as he could love you know and she back to him as well because she was a very complex character in her own right I, I have some pictures here of her soon um, she helped to resolve some of his sexual phobias put it that way um, now then what have we got here oh here she is no one came closer close to her despite people probably trying to get in between Dolly and her gala. And she, she does have a very, you know, she stares out in a very confident way. When you consider it's him that's painting her, um, she's obviously feeling quite in command of everything, you know. She's got his measure, shall we say. <laughs> and uh, there's another one of her. Now, Dali did go into the world of film as well when he was in America. Because the Americans, unlike the Europeans at the time, they were very much more flexible um, and things were going on in Hollywood and new paths were being forged in the film industry and topics being aired that had never been aired before. And Alfred Hitchcock did a film called Spellbound which starred Ingrid Bergman and Gregory Peck. And Ingrid Bergman was a psychiatrist in a hospital and Gregory Peck, you know, like an asylum as they called it in those days, and Gregory Peck was um, someone who'd lost his memory and didn't quite know if he'd killed someone or not. <laughs> so anyway, she ended, they uh, fell for each other and all the rest of it. But in the film, there was a dream sequence. And Alfred Hitchcock wanted Salvador Dali to do the dream sequence, the images. And people said at the time, you know, cynical people said, oh, you know, Alfred Hitchcock's only picking him because he's famous and it'll be a shoe in everybody will come and see the film. But Hitchcock said that wasn't the reason. He said, people say that dreams are fuzzy and unable to be uh, defined. He said, but they're not. They're very sharp. And D Dali had a way of showing sharp in images, sharp shadows, and just the kind of images that Hitchcock needed for a film so he did do that and you can see the some of the dream sequences on the internet or better still go and see the you know get the film and have a look at Spellbound because it's quite an interesting film um, so uh, let's see here there is a oh, I've Harlequin's done me some pictures from Spellbound so I'll show that to you um, I like this image here of him behind the easel with his hand up. I, I really like that. It's almost like a 
uh, old style painter, you know, like Goya's time or something, the outfit he's got on and everything. Right. Okay, I was just looking at the time. And now here's another one here. Every now and again through his paintings, uh, Dali shows a small boy. Um, and whether or not part of it's um, thinking of his brother or, or it's representing him as a child, I don't really know. But this one is the spectre of sex appeal. The tiny child in a sailor suit at the lower right, who represents Dali, holds a hoop and a thigh bone and stands facing his obtruding memories, which have to do with fears of sexual failure and violence. I mean, he must have been so tormented at times. And he was uh, Catholic. He was, he, you know, he was brought into the Catholic experience as a child. Um, and he always said he fervently wanted to believe in God, but he just couldn't. He, he just couldn't get the faith. And he was, throughout his life, he was wanting to do that, to, to get the faith. And from some of the images that he does later in life, uh, maybe maybe he got there in the end. Who knows? Um, now, this one is called Metamorphosis of Narcissus. And it says a key work along those lines prepared in detailed drawings is the Metamorphosis of Narcissus, finished in 1937. Dali presented this brilliantly executed and carefully thought through painting to Sigmund Freud during one of Dali's visits to London. Narcissus, the self-enamoured figure from Greek mythology, who was entranced by his own reflection in a pool, stands out from a group of figurines in the background, his body at once turning it to stone and taking on the fetal position in standing water, which we can presume represents amniotic fluid. Uh, it is symbolic because, da da da, anyway, we'll go for too long on there, but there is, and really, it's rocks, isn't it? But you can see there's a figure there and the reflection in the water. And then the figures in the background there. So I think that that's why he said that the landscape was so much a part of him. He could see figures and animals and all sorts in the landscape. Now, if you recall, I mentioned the lobster phone. Um, the lobster telephone, 1936. Now, <laughs> these days you get hamburgers that are phones, you know. <laughs> And all sorts of things. But then, I mean, no one had ever thought of such a thing. And the shape of it is very much like a telephone receiver, isn't it? Then the other very famous image from Dali's times is the Mae West Lips Sofa. Now, if you just bear with me for one moment. That. She is Mae West. Oh, I think I'll just turn the resolution down. And he was fascinated, Dali was fascinated with her lips. Now it's not meant to be sat on, but that is what he created. That's his sculpture. And that comes in later uh, in his museum. And you'll see what I mean in a little while. Now then, um, let 
This one here is called The Invisible Afghan. And it comes from his Paranoia series, what he called it. And if you look, you will see that there is a bowl of fruit there. Oh gosh. A bowl of fruit. And then there's in the distance. So I'm trying to hold all my markers in. There's a dog there. That's the head of the dog and that's the dog's nose. There is another picture, very similar, that I can show you better. But that's one of them anyway. That's the invisible Afghan. Um, right, now. Oh, and here's the flaming... Uh, the burning giraffe uh, and the other one that I showed you earlier. In terms of artistic technique, well, it's the same painting, but they've got the foreground and the and a close-up of the background. In terms of artistic technique, this small panel painting is not one of Dali's outstanding achievements, and yet its startlingly inventive motifs and emotional accessibility have made it one of the best-known pictures of the 20th century. The giraffe, which appears unperturbed by the flames covering its neck and back, might be understood to symbolise animals' harmony with nature. Um, and so what's, what this person has done, he's shown this image and then he's shown the distant image there with a the figure in it, just so that you can see it better. She really is quite a remarkable picture. I can remember at school thinking, well, I didn't know what to make of it. And see these drawers, some have said that those drawers in the, le in the leg and the chest of the figure are how you tuck away all your memories, all your, and your inhibitions and things and hide them away. Um, so that no one can see them. So I'll just have a quick look at this one to see if there was anything. Okay. All right. Well, we're getting towards the end of this book now. Um, here, it's just to give you an image. This is the great paranoiac and once again he's obsessed with the double image because there are all these people here and yet there's a face in there as well that's, I mean that's a person sitting but you can see a face that's the nose and that's the lips and the cheekbone and the forehead and in films like Labyrinth David Bowie was somebody who was very keen to meet Dali. And in Labyrinth, you can see uh, an image that's made from rocks jutting out. It's like a 3D uh, in that film that he made, um, which was directly influenced, I'm sure, by Dali. Then we've got the face of Vermeer here. Um, and it says, Dali took a painting by Dutch Baroque painter Jean Vermeer as an occasion to, as he said, delve into the psychological problems of vision. And it, it shows someone reading a letter, but on closer inspection, we see a face that resembles Vermeer looming out of the picture. So... There's someone, a figure, looking at a letter. And there's the gown, and the head, and the shoulder. But then if we look at this as the cheek, and that as the eye, and that as the nose, there's Vermeer. And his hair, of course, coming down. Then this one here is particularly grotesque. 
Um, and it's uh, the face of war, 1940 to 1941. Well, a lot of the Dalí's generation had been through the First World War. And after that, polite society for certain groups, elite groups, got turned on its head. I mean, they just they were grieving over friends they'd lost. They were, you know, all the things that they held dear to them were being challenged and all the rest of it. Um, and then they turned around and challenged things as well. So it must have been a very um, depressing time, uh, a time of great upheaval and things just not, being the way they were, uh, it would have been very difficult for some of them. Now here we are, swans reflecting elephants. And I'll show you that one afterwards because it's very hard to hold this book and I've got another picture of it. But I will show you this one here, Daddy Longlegs of the Evening, because that spider, I just love it. Just look at the shadow of the spider and how he's got it sitting up off the page there. Just love that. Um, oh, now this one's quite remarkable as well. Um, the costume designed for Mad Tristan, the ship. Uh, he got together with Coco Chanel and um, costumes were designed and everything for a premiere of Bacchanal at the Metropolitan Opera in New York in 1939. The costumes were unavailable due to the war in Europe, so then he designed his own costumes which were used in a later performance in New York in 1944. But I don't know if this person actually wore that as a costume, but just look at that sea. I mean, what? it's just magnificent, isn't it? What an imagination. Now, he also took a go at designing jewellery. And this one is called The Eye of Time. 1949 Platinum Watch Set with Rubies. And typically, he's got a tear there, the tear of a clown. Now this one is really one of the most bizarre ones. It's called The Temptation of St. Anthony. Um, and he has these animals almost looking as though they're on stilts. And there's St. Anthony there. And, you know, I think it's a case of make of it what you will. Uh, quite shocking. But they did, I think I read somewhere uh, that he sort of saw himself a little bit as St. Anthony. So I'm not quite sure about that one. He might have just been saying it. Uh, here's soft watch and he's because he goes into the nuclear age I mean that's almost anyone who's seen my Escher video would see a bit of Escher in that MC Escher but the landscape once again dominates so much of Dali's thought processes Now here is the museum that I mentioned in Figaris. Now Dali designed the building, there it is, and I've got some more closer up ones that uh, uh, were printed out for me. But see he, he has an in, interest in eggs as well, that oval shape. Um, and here, oh well I'll show you that one. And the other pictures I've got, because it'd be easier. 
And here he is, holding court, probably in his 80s there, but still the consummate showman. Still got his moustache. I mean, for all we knew, no, he might have been feeling absolutely disgusting that day. <laughs> he might have been feeling dreadful, but the show had to go on. And that's, I think, very much what he was like. And this one here is his version of Adam. You know, the Sistine Chapel Michelangelo uh, masterpiece. Well, Dully had a go at him at as well. And then I will now go finally to some of the most powerful images of a religious nature. And there's this one of the Last Supper. I mean, people criticised Dali for his works saying that the imagination had nowhere to go because he'd done it all. But in this, I think he does manage to evoke feelings in the viewer. And this particular one is, I think, one of the best portrayals of the crucifixion that has ever been done. I mean, the power of it. And I think for Dali, he must have had a certain amount of reverence and maybe faith in there. This is a detail from the bottom here and of course the relevance of the fishermen and the disciples and I think there was a line there in the Bible where they're all they've been fishing all night and they've caught nothing and they came in to the shore and they said to Jesus, oh look, we haven't caught anything, so we're, we're giving up for the day. And he said, oh no, you go out again and uh, you'll catch some fish. And it was basically, they didn't want to do it, but out of faith, out of belief in him, they did go out and they did, they were overflowing with fish. <laughs> so I, that sat in my head. Right, so now... We are going on to the last little part here of the pictures that that rustling is just me getting my, I've got my summary up there that I wrote this morning. Uh, I'm going to go through these ones that have been printed out for me just to see if there's anything else to say and then we'll close. So that's the Time magazine, and on the other side, this must be, a, I wonder if it's uh, Luxembourg it's got here, Salvador Dali, genie, genius I should imagine that says, or charlatan. <laughs> it's one of the pages of their magazine. I think you can be both, can't you? No. <laughs> Here is some of the images from Alfred Hitchcock's film, Spellbound. And this is where Gregory Peck is describing a recurrent dream that he just can't understand. Um, and here, you'll recognise that image now. And a figure behind the chimney, which also has roots to it. Um, so there was that one. Then there's the figure with the distorted wheel and no features. And then 
a bar somewhere with all those eyes. And through this psychoanalysis, the character of Ingrid Bergman was trying to understand what was going on. Now here is where Dali influenced fashion. And that is the shoe hat. Then here he is at his beloved fisherman's hut that um, grew as, you know, started just one little room and then he just built on and built on and built on. And those little hooks there. But look at that hat. <laughs> um, now this painting here was where he was into the double images again because it's it's a group of African villagers and there's their home, their hut and the bush in the background but then when you turn it it's a face and there is footage of him actually doing that in, in a museum somewhere Dali's standing there with it showing someone and then he turns it. Now here's the elephants one that I was talking about, you know, that was in the book but it was a bit too difficult to show you. Um, there are the swans but their images become elephant trunks and they're, they're uh, and their bodies become ears, the elephant's ears, and you can see the legs there. That's the reflection of the trees behind. So you've got the elephants there and the swans above the waterline, all mixed in. Now this one is always one of my favourites. And this is the one, another one with a dog. So you've got the fruit bowl there going up and the pears and of course it's also a face. There's a shell for, for an eye and a piece of a ship for the other eye. And then as you go up you get this here, the rocks and everything, going up and then the dog's ear, head and nose and there's his collar. And it's the apparition of fruit dish on a beach, 1938. Optical illusion. Face, bowl of fruit and a dog. Now this here was a very famous, uh, you know, the telephone, the, um, what was it, a crayfish or something, I'm getting, it's getting towards the end now, I'm getting a bit frazzled, but anyway, the lobster phone, <laughs> telephone, uh, someone saw fit to make it into a piece of fashion, and there is an image of the Duchess of Windsor, Wallace Simpson, wearing that dress. Um, I'll just have a quick look to see if I've got it here. And there she is. Of course she had a sense, a great sense of fashion and style. She was a very, very stylish person. Um, now here's some of his own fashion. What's he got there? A microscope. Oh, and the, the suit. He's actually got some straws in the glasses so that they're, they're actually attached to his suit. It's not a print uh, on material it's actually glasses on there <laughs> oh, how typical <laughs> and here's the uh, 
see if I can find. Oh, anyway, I'll put that one there and show you that in a minute. Jewelry. He had a go at that. Pearls with rubies around for the Mae West lips. This one is particularly bizarre, actually. It's a brooch. And it actually pulsated so that those uh, rubies would move apart slightly and it'd just be like a beating heart. Uh, that was very odd. And there's that uh, Eye of Time again, 1949. There he is with Gala. What's he saying? She's the boss. <laughs> now here's the one that I was talking about, the May West lounge that wasn't meant to be sat on. Now this is at his museum and his crypt where, where he's entombed. And you can see the Mae West hair. Apparently, when you're walking around this museum, you go up to a certain level and you can look down on his lounge, as he would call it, a lounge, a room. And that was the fireplace, which was, of course, her nostrils. And there's her mouth. And the paintings on the walls were her eyes. So, very much a perspective person. Now here's the outside of the museum here, and these, if I can get closer, I don't think I do, but that, those little dots are all little loaves, little bread rolls kind of things, and he said they were like goosebumps on the building. He, he was fascinated with bread, as I said before. Um... And here, when visitors go in, they walk over that and they're, a lot of them are completely unaware that that is his crypt. Um, and you see it on another level underneath. So I suppose that's his quiet little joke on them, that they're walking over the top of him and don't even know they're doing it. Right. Just some final ones here. A lot of these I've already shown you. They were in the, the book. This was The Discovery of America by Christopher Columbus, 1959. There's Gala's face on there. I don't know if that might be the Santa Maria, I guess. The Nina, the Pinter and the Santa Maria. I remember that from a long time ago. Uh, right. He also was... Oh, and here's the one I was going to show you, the fashion of the Mae West dress there. And that is from another image of one of his paintings. Right, well, to sum up. <laughs> Surrealism, and I do have the definitions here, but I, I haven't read them out. Um, but I, I think you you know what surrealism is, really. It's just putting out there things that um, most people don't, I guess. Surrealism allowed Dali to finally release all of his fears, anxiety and obsessions in a way that would give him the recognition he desired. But the paradox was his shyness and timidity was still there. Um, death and sex obsessed him. Um, and my summary 
Dali's stark and vivid paintings and sculptures express thoughts and desires openly that many individuals experience but will not dare to actually express. The natural tendency is to self-censor and to hide and suppress these vivid images and thoughts. Um, would Dali have gone down this path had his mother lived? Uh, we will never know. And I, I really do wonder what the course of his life would have been, whether he would have kept all that repressed inside him uh, because he didn't want to outrage his mother. Um, who knows? I mean, I think his father sort of made, him easy, made it easy for Dali to rebel because he was such a stern authoritarian figure. It was easy to do that. But his mother was the love of his life. Uh, he was devastated. He, he just didn't know what to do with himself. Ultimately, surrealism is the liberation of the imagination, isn't it? Well, it is. Uh, it gives uh, a largely accepted avenue of expression to those who do not feel they fit in. Minority groups own a, owe a great deal to Dali. Dali has done more to facilitate their causes, I imagine, than probably any other artist. Dali was not the only one to forge the way, but through his out there style, he expedited the process of self-expression. And I think the last word should certainly go to Dali himself. And he says, when I paint, the sea roars, the others just splash about in the bath. So, um, for anyone who, young, you know, I think really young people may not know much about Dali, as much as my generation anyway, uh, but he certainly has left his mark on everything. That's what I think anyway. <laughs> so, anyway, so I shall finish off now. Uh, thank you so much for anyone who has kept watching all this time. <laughs> Um, but it really was, it, I don't know if it was a dip into Dali, it was a complete immersion into Dali, I don't really know. Uh, I didn't put out there everything that I have here, but I, you know, it probably isn't necessary now anyway. So, uh, I will see you in, uh, I don't know if it'll be a week or so, I'm still getting my threads together for Heaven on Earth um, to get that organised. In the meantime, I'll keep ploughing on with um, the dragons um, and some other things. And until next time, thank you for spending time with me and I shall see you again. Bye for now.